Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, so last session of the day, I hope I can keep your attention here. I, I think we've got some pretty exciting things happening in the cybersecurity world. So, um, so uh, you know, when asked to, to do this session and, you know, thinking back on, you know, what's happening in this industry and, you know, what are the things that, um, you know, as, as a community involved in, in logistics and automation. So what are the kind of things that you really need to be um, aware of? Well, I, I think you're probably aware of, of some of these, um, these trends, but I wanna go a little deeper into them and maybe give you a little better understanding and then some resources um, that you could use in incorporating um, some of these trends and, and things that your students are gonna need to know about um, within your classes. So that's, that's my goal for the, for the session. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen and we'll start to, start to uh, talk about some of these things, okay? So um, when, when I'm asked recently to talk about, you know, what's happening in the industry that's really gonna be, you know, a significant change and it's gonna have a, a massive impact, uh, especially in, in your community, I really think what's happening with the CMMC program is really the thing that you need to be aware of and, and um, sort of on top of, and uh, hopefully have a better understanding of it. So for you that don't know what CMMC stands for, it stands for the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. So last year, um, what happened is that um, Congress you know, funded a, a program to harden our Department of Defense supply chain. And I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with with what's going on with this. And the idea is that in the future, um, contractors and subcontractors that are interested in applying for um, awards with the, any of the Department of Defense um, agencies or, or organizations are gonna to have to show that they um, have passed a cybersecurity audit and that they are moving along that path to maturity. So this is all about a maturity model. So the idea is this, you know, over the years, we've been training technicians in, in, um, in cybersecurity, how to use the different tools and, you know, how to assess different products and uh, implement secure communications. And there's just a whole caveat of things, you know, the NICE framework really spells out all, all those things, right? And in the past, what we did is we had, we had a, a NIST um, framework that basically said, these are the things as an organization that you should do. You need to look at these things, see what's applicable to your organization, and then make sure you do them, right? The problem is, um, you know, many organizations, just like people, will not necessarily do things unless, you know, they're, they're absolutely forced to do it, right? And someone is checking that they're doing it. In a lot of cases, they may not do it right, right? So a maturity model, what it's all about basically is bringing an organization like the, the Department of Defense Supply Chain, which by the way, encompasses every aspect of, of business, everything from, you know, from uniforms to tools to, to jet airplanes, right? Um, there's over 300,000 um, companies that, that this will impact, right? Um, but the idea is that the federal government is now embracing this idea of a maturity model and making us as a group go through this process of maturing our cyber landscape, right? And our um, operational um, areas and, and institutions. Uh, and that's what uh, the CMMC basically is, is all about. So um, about a year ago, two of the cybersecurity centers got together and I'm sure you probably heard somewhat of, of us. So um, I'm from the Cassia Center for the Center of System Security and Information Assurance. We're outside Chicago. Um, and we've worked with, with um, many of you and, and many different institutions across the country in cybersecurity over the years. And the Insight Center, which is on the West Coast out of Washington State at Whatcom Community College, um, and their PI, uh, Corinne Sandy, uh, approached me and said, you know, what do you know of the CMMC things? What if, you know, we got together and um, we put together some type of program and some content that we could um, distribute to schools and, and specifically community colleges um, that are preparing, you know, our future technical workforce and um, maybe some classes to bring faculty up to speed and talk about how this information could be disseminated and then integrated into curriculum. So basically we took about six months and we, you know, we did some pretty deep investigation of how we could do this and, you know, what the model encompassed and so on. Uh, and we came up with a, with a course. And now we're in the process of actually going through the CMMC accreditation board and actually getting recognized so that we'll be in their marketplace and we could use it you know, within the marketplace itself. Um, but what the CMMC program is all about is to take this 
you know, huge organization, the Department of Defense supply chain, right? And strengthen it, make it more secure, more resilient against cyber attacks, right? So let me just give you a visual, first of all, of what CMMC is all about, just so you can sort of visually see what this is. So um, if I go here, this is, by the way, a toolkit that was built at um, Heartland Science and Technology Group um, at um, Champaign-Urbana with an association with the University of Illinois. Uh, but this is actually literally a, a tool that organizations will be able to use in the future in preparing for a cyber um, audit associated with getting their CMMC certification. Okay, so basically what is CMMC? But what it basically does is it builds upon the NIST framework, all right, um, the 171 framework, which, which identified 17 different domains. So these are just different areas that we need to be concerned about when we're talking about cybersecurity. So it starts off with things like access control, and then it goes into asset management, auditing and accountability, and you know, awareness and training, and you, you get the idea. It just goes across all of these different areas, right? And what they did is they defined specific capabilities that an organization needs to um, have in order to strengthen their organization against um, different types of breaches and cyber attacks and so on, right? But the idea is you just can't throw this pretty sophisticated program out there for everyone and say, just do all of these things, right? What we basically need, need to do with this community is build maturity, right? Build the capabilities of doing all these things and doing them right, right? So what they did is they built a five-tiered model and that's what the CMMC basically is all about. And it's based on these 17 domains, right? And then again, each domain will have capabilities. And that's what we see in these item areas, right? So that you see what, what's highlighted in red versus pink and so on, all right? And then that there's five levels that organizations can certify through. So ultimately, everyone's going to have to certify at level one, right? And level one consists of these specific capabilities. Right? And then when we go to level two, it's a transitionary level, look how many we add on. So it's a much bigger lift, right? And then ultimately we wanna see all organizations get to level three. So this is what level three would basically look like. And then there's level four and then level five would basically be covering all of the capabilities, okay? So that's what the maturity model is all about is really onboarding organizations to begin to not only think about and, and have a checklist of things that they need to do as an organization to secure their systems and their information, but to prove it, right? So how does that impact us as organizations that are training the, the next generation of, of workers in, in this area? Well, what we're trying to do as, as um, uh, a center is uh, to create a, a course, which we, we've created, I'll share with you, and to give schools the tools and resources that they can build into their existing curriculum and their existing courses. We're not saying that this has to necessarily be its own standalone course or standalone program, although I'm sure there will be schools that, that look into that, right? But more, um, more often, what I think we're, we're going to see is how can schools look at these things and build these into their existing programs? And can we create activities and assessments um, so that students learn that when, as an example, if they're installing a firewall, they don't need to, you know, it doesn't stop there. Yes, they need to know how to configure the firewall, but they also need to know how to test it. And then more importantly, they need to know how to document that to prove to someone that it aligns to the organization's requirements or policies, right? And that it's been tested and that it works. So that might be scraping logs. It may be you know, a series of, of tests and so on. And then ultimately collecting those artifacts and sharing them with the team that's preparing for an audit. Okay, so, um, so that's what this initiative is all about. And it really is the future of cybersecurity because I will guarantee you that the Department of Defense is not the only place that's gonna do this. We're gonna start to see more and more vertical markets do this. And we're gonna start to see other federal agencies do this. This is really the future of cybersecurity. We're not only going to have those practices and, and procedures spelled out, but now we're going to wanna to have very specific um, audit items that we're going to look for in, in order to do business and literally to do business. So you will not be able to get a contract with an organization without showing that you have, you know, these capabilities. Okay. So um, in a nutshell, that is what the CMMC program is all about. So I just wanted to give you sort of a visual, make sure you got the idea. 
Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about CMMC, um, and you know maybe hopefully this takes out some of the um, you know I've heard a lot of things like it's an impossible thing, organizations aren't going to do it, and so on. I don't think they're going to have a choice ultimately. Um, but it's not an impossible thing because it was built as a maturity model. So, so organizations will gradually build to, um, to, to that level. And let's show you what, a, what a, um, a capability is. So if I click on this first one, um, this is the actual capability. So up here, this is the first capability in the first domain, right? So establish system access requirements, okay? So an organization has to prove that they can do this, right? And what we, what we are given then are the actual NIST um, 171 um, framework. So it, it spells it out in great detail and then gives examples and so on. And then what we're going to have are tools like this where now an organization is going to be able to go in and actually give, um, be given information on how to collect the artifacts that are necessary um, to go through an audit like this. Okay. So um, what we've done, uh, again, the Cassia Center and the Insight Center have gotten together and, and they've developed a faculty development workshop. It's a two-day workshop. And I'll let, let Corinne talk a little bit about how you register for it. Um, but basically, uh, or share the, the link on how do you register for it. Um, but basically what we've been doing, we've, we've offered, I believe, five of these now and they've all filled. So there's actually a waiting list. Um, and we've talked to people in, in, uh, at, at um, at the center here, we know that there's going to be a need um, in this community as well as the cybersecurity community, and we're getting we're getting requests from all different areas of of, um, uh, of business that deal with federal agencies to have a better understanding of this because this is really everyone's responsibility. It's not just the cybersecurity people; it's all the technical workforce that work within these organizations have to have some understanding of this process and ultimately have to participate in the process of going through the audit itself. Okay. So let me show you what the course is all about, just to give you an idea. So we put the course up um, in uh, the Canvas infrastructure, you know, open website. So it's 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 on the um, the open website, um, and we basically created modules that go through and give a a pretty in depth review of what CMMC is all about. So to understand CMMC, you have to know something about controlled unclassified information. And contract information, we go into great detail into that. We talk about the use of a dashboard. And then chapter one basically goes in and defines what the framework is all about. So it talks about the difference between CUI and FOU uh, you all. It talks about this, this advanced persistent threat, which is the reason we have this. The whole idea of safeguarding federal contract information. And then we go into the actual model itself, okay? Um, now, we've done some really unusual things with this course. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we've built in interactive activities. Um, and we sort of borrowed these from, um, from Mike Cassani at, at Brookdale um, Community College. He, he had an um, a NSF grant to create um, these interactions that we refer to as emates, right? And we've actually built some of these for this course. So I'll show you a little bit of that, and then we'll go into a little more detail about what other things we've done with these emates, okay? Um, but this is the first chapter and sort of what it goes through. And if you want to see, you know, one of the emates, this is an example of an emate. All right. So in here, this is all written in HTML5. And basically, you can use this to do your lecture. So if I'm going to go in and talk about the structure, I can talk about the five domains and so on. Or I can give this to a student. And many of these will have assessments that go at the end of them that we can actually measure their, their um their competency in the, in the um, different areas um, that we're presenting. All right, and then it goes into the domains, but you get the idea, it's almost like a little ebook, but it's an application that, that interfaces with the students and they control, or you can use it in the actual, your presentations. And what we've done is we've embedded these emates throughout the course. So not only in, um, in demonstrating what CMC is all about and, and you know, deconstructing the model and how it works, but also when we get into each of the domains and the requirements in each domain, there's also um, emates that, that go into those things as well, okay? And then we have like a short introduction to each one of the domains and you get the idea. So, um, so that's what the emates all about. And we've embedded them in there. And then we also have assessments um, throughout the course. Um, and then the, the sort of neat thing that we've done as well is that we've given you these interactive PowerPoints. 
So let me show you one of these, just so you, you can just see this a little bit. Um, Uh, and by the way, they are up in the um, um, the course itself. So if you take the course, you'll get all of these things. But if you go into files, okay, um, and you go into PowerPoints, um, they're all up here. But what we tried to do was make a PowerPoint that was a little more interactive and, and it actually um, it deconstructed the, um, the framework a little better than a typical PowerPoint. So we did these little PowerPoint um, animations. So I'll download one here and just show it to you real quick. Um, so we download it. And this is what it looks like. Oh, you know, I'm gonna have to stop sharing and share my other screen for a second. All right. All right, can you see that? Is that working okay? Yep, it's showing perfectly. Thanks, John. All right, so you know, here we're basically going to the first domain, right? In the first domain, we are um, showing the first um, cap um, the first um, uh, capability, and then basically the, the um, capabilities are supported by practices, and the practices are at each of the five different levels of the model. So in this case, we have the first practice at level one, then we have two other practices at level two, there's none in level three in this particular one. So if you click on it, um, we'll go in and look at the first practice. So here's the first practice, limit system access to authorized users, um, processes acting on behalf of authorized users or devices, including other systems. So we give some examples here, and then we show what's necessary if you're gonna go through an audit. So here's what the audit would look for. These are the objectives of the audit. All right, here is acceptable evidence. We want to incorporate some of these things in our classes to teach students how to actually collect some of this stuff, right? Um, and then finally, who might be interviewed as part of the audit? So these, be, these would be the individuals that might be um, um, you know, interviewed as part of the audit and what types of questions might they be asked and so on. So that's sort of how we broke this down. So it's very practical um, and this could be used in basically any, um, um, environment. And then also what tests might be performed to prove um, that the systems meet the compliance, right? And we basically do that for every practice. So we break this entire thing down and give you all of those things that would be necessary in this case um, to go through an audit. And the nice part of this is you could go in and extract these things um, and determine which of them might be useful in one of your, uh, one of your courses, okay? So um, that's what the course basically is all about. Um, Again, it's in, um, it's in Canvas. So the idea is once you go through the course, uh, if you'd like, you can, um, you can actually um, get a copy of it. So um, you can download it and use it in your own Canvas or import it into whichever um, you know, system you're basically using, okay? So um, that is the CMMC course. In, uh, Karin, can, uh, do you have audio? Do you wanna jump in and talk about enrollment for it? Oh, maybe not. Okay, so um, if you check chat, if you check chat, she's going to um, um, add the link to how you can actually um, register. But we've actually created um, a faculty development workshop uh, for this community if you're interested in actually taking the course. But again, we're going to be offering these um, starting in June in our two-day courses, um, and and again, you get all of the stuff with it. And I really didn't show you the full scope of the course; just you, you, you get a feel for it. Um, but I just showed you the first chapter um, and then each of the other chapters go into the specific domains. So you can see, so it consists of 18 different modules and each one of them have assessments and all kinds of different activities and emates and so on um, threaded throughout the, um, uh, the program, okay? Um, so that's what I wanted to show you with the um, course itself. Uh, and then I wanted to just to show a couple other resources that we're working on in the cybersecurity realm um, with, with the different um, national centers and projects. Uh, we've got a couple other um, interesting projects going on that we that I thought we might want to show you, right? Um, so one that I definitely want to take a minute and show you is that uh, Mike and I, Mike, do you have, um, do you have audio? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. 
Um, so Mike and I, um, you know, he, we've been working on a, a couple of initiatives over the last couple of years. And, and one of the big initiatives in, in our um, community is reaching more down into the high schools in making high school students more aware of the opportunities and the jobs that are out there in cybersecurity. So we thought about how could we do this? Part of the problem we have is that most of these environments that cybersecurity professionals work in are not gonna be real easy for people to get access to, right? They're gonna be socks and skiffs and so on. And, um, and most students uh, and high school students will never have the opportunity to actually see these people working in, you know, in one of these environments. So we thought about what if we bring the environments to the students themselves and we do that through a VR ex experience. So we actually were able to um, receive an, uh, an NSA, NSA grant um, to do that. And we are actually done with the first phase of it. So um, I'll, I'll bring up the demo of this, but um, the idea behind this is that what we're gonna basically give out to high schools and ultimately give to other schools and so on is the ability for an individual to go through a facility a guided tour, you could say, somewhat through the facility, interact with avatars in that facility and the environment, and be able to learn who are the different people and what are the different job roles that are involved in cybersecurity? What are the different knowledge and skills? What are the different qualifications that are necessary and so on? And this is what we came up with, and this is the first iteration of it. So I just got a little video here I'll share with you. All right, um, is it on the right screen? Yes. Okay. So um, basically, it, it starts off by students checking in at the facility and getting their badge. Uh oh, there we go. So they'd come in and at the at the front desk, they would have to fill out forms and so on, and they would get their badge, right? And the idea is there are going to be avatars throughout this, and we have what we call Easter eggs that are planted throughout the um, facility that they learn about the nature of work, the sort of the types of qualifications, certifications, um, the um, uh, individuals that work there, their titles, um, things like that. So here we go, we, we get our badge and now the person's off and they can go into one of seven facilities, okay? Why seven facilities? Well, we base this again on the NICE framework. And remember the NICE framework broke it down into seven types of general work, right? And we have a facility area where we've sort of congregated avatars that do that type of work in somewhat of a facility that they would do it in, right? So when they go into one, they're going to see tablets on the wall and they can click out and get information about it. And it will really give them, you know, sort of the things that you get with a nice framework. OK, uh, but the beauty here is look at this. They can go in and they can access systems. So there's music with it. I don't know if you're hearing the music. But they can open documents. They can interface with the avatars. But we tried to gamify it and make it a little more interesting than just giving like a PowerPoint. And they'll be on a little mission that as they collect this information, they'll be able to put it into a, um, into a, like a briefcase and be able to use that then to answer questions and finish a challenge when they're done. We can show videos in here. And am I sharing audio? Let me see if I'm sharing audio. No, okay. You are, but it's very low. Now. There we go. Okay, and this is the actual 3D map of the different seven different areas. So they can teleport into each of the different areas, or they can basically take stairs or an elevator or whatever to go into them. And these are functioning facilities. Oh, this is John. John, you're showing uh, just your um, share screen. We're not seeing the video. Oh, it's not seeing the video, huh? All right, let me stop. So we're second. seeing the cyber secure dashboard right now. Oh, I must pick the wrong side then. All right, so share. I'll, I'll share the link to the video in the chat too, so okay. they have it. All right, how about now? Yep. Good. All right, there we go. So, um, so here to open up a document, they could be watching a presentation. They can actually click on the different avatars and have discussions with them and find out information about the different individuals that work in that facility. And again, it's a challenge, so there'll be- A combination of technical know-how, persistence, and customer service skills are needed to be a computer support specialist. 
They provide essential help and advice to users of computer software and related equipment in virtually every type of organization in the country. There are two types of specialists. So see, you can even bring up an individual here. So see, they have an avatar now activated. They can go in and find out about that avatar. They can look at their credentials, their education, training, or inspiration, so on. Um, so there's all kinds of things to interface with. But it's a little more interesting for a high school student because now they can go in and explore this on their own. Um, and, and really, we, we're trying to gamify this. Um, so that's um, the idea behind the 3D environment. Now, just to let you know, um, we've also put in to do this in 2D. So any student would be able to do this with, with just a simple um, Chromebook. Um, so that's, that's the, the next step with this. Um, and then ultimately, Mike and I have this vision that we would use this same environment to do exercises. So a student goes through a series of labs, and now we want to test their capabilities, their knowledge and skills in a, in a, a specific environment, right, in a challenge. So we put them into one of these rooms, an attack is going on, one that's going to require that they use the skills that they just learned, and they'll have to react to different things that are going on. But that's, that's sort of the next phase that we see um, um, using this environment for. But, um, but the beauty of this, and, and this is sort of Mike's um, idea, is that you know, we can basically just change the skin of this. If we want to show healthcare, we change the skin and it's a hospital now, right? If we want to show a manufacturing environment, we could change the skill, it's a manufacturing environment, um, so on, right? Um, but the idea is that, you know, we would have similar avatars and, and Easter eggs could be very similar and we're just switching out the um, environment that, that they're in, okay? So those are two that I, um, I wanted to, to share with you. Um, and then I thought I'd let uh, Mike talk a little bit about um, this, this project with eMates and what we've been doing in the area of cybersecurity with eMates. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this for a second so you can see this. So again, it's at our website. Are you seeing this now that I've moved it in that screen? Yep, see it. All right, all right. So um, Mike's got a, 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 a project from the National Science Foundation um, that has funded um, the development of these uh, of these emates. Uh, you know, I'll let him little talk a little bit about the background and, and what these are all about. Maybe we can demo a couple of these for you. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, so, so the the um, it, this is sort of an interesting um, um, cro uh, intersection because um, we were the the project that developed the original um, um, uh, introduction to the automated warehouse ebook. So uh, and and built all those interactives that went in that. So we worked on that project and uh, so that they just presented on that uh, for the supply chain center. And so, so what we learned from that project was that the, the real value in those interactive eBooks came from the interactive. So we proposed another project to focus just on building the interactives and focused on, on a number of STEM areas. And the idea here was that if we could just build interactives to address the concepts that students are struggling with. And so everybody teaches social engineering and cybersecurity. So this is a great area to be able to to, to do this. And, and again, these are all HTML5, so they'll work on any modern web browser. You don't need Flash or Java or any plugins. They'll work on a Chromebook, so, so it's very easy to distribute. Um, they'll, they'll even work offline. So here they're posted um, in a number of places. So there, some of them are posted at Cassia's website. Some of them are posted at the uh, the uh, Insight website. So we'll be consolidating all of that in the near future. But in cybersecurity, we've built probably about 50 and we have plans for, uh, for probably another 30. So if you have uh, an interest in a topic and, and, a, and you think a topic that would really benefit from this approach, let us know and we can put that in the queue to develop. So I think right now we just added quantum computing and AI to our list. So somebody wants an introduction to quantum computing. So, so, so again, the nice thing about this is that the student actually has to go and they have to perform an action. So this is baiting where somebody leaves a flash drive that says payroll on it and you actually have to click it and then plug it into your computer and then your computer gets compromised. So, so it really um, uh, forces the student to think about their role in getting uh, attacked by social engineering. So here you click on the cell phone and so the bad guy is taking a picture of somebody logging in, getting, getting their username and password. Again, the, I tell my students, the bad guys always have red devil horns. So you have to keep that in mind. 
pretexting where you're uh, calling somebody pretending to be from IT, for example. So, so there's, it's it's a whole list of them that students can go through, and then they have a, a, a little bit of uh, you know um, uh, the fact that social engineering is on the rise and how to mitigate attacks. So, so uh, again, gives them a nice overview of these. Um, in the CMMC course, John covered uh, access control. And so if you look right at the top of the Cassia website, and I posted that link earlier, the, one of the first ones there is uh, the um, access control. So that's a nice interactive that in addition to teaching with the slides and the, and the content from the CMMC, there's an interactive now that you can walk, uh, walk students through and explain, explain you know, what an authorized uh, access is, what unauthor uh, uh, unauthorized is, goes through the concept of subjects and objects and what those are and how they access resources. So I've used this a couple of times just this week in my classes. And one of the, the neat things is you can uh, explain all of this interactively. The students can go through it on their own. And this one I like because it shows that that portal in the middle there, when it's accessing the authentication server, switches to, an, to a, a subject and then switches back to an object interacting with the, uh, the user. And then you have uh, IAAA, which is identification, authentication, authorization, and accountability. So it's, it's sort of the approach that we take in cybersecurity in order to provide access to people. And I think we're working on one. We've got, um, uh, we've got uh, what else, uh, biometrics on the list as well as something that we'd like to do. So, so we've built a whole series of these. There's some in mathematics. Um, there's some in networking, some in electronics, um, and, and at, at my college, we've also got some hosted in um, in chemistry, um, in physics, and in um, environmental science. So I'll put my email address here. If anybody's interested, um, they can contact me. And you can see they're very interactive. So it, you know, there's exercises where um, you know we can test that they're they're picking up. Um, the terminology and making placings, they get the mechanics of it and so on. Um, but the idea is to really reach the different types of learning styles, right? So there's audio in here, it's very tactical, very visual, um, so on. Um, but there's a pretty significant library now of these. And um, I, I think they would be, you know, this group may be really interested in some of the other ones. We have, we have things like in electronics. So if you take a look, we've done things on, um, if you're teaching logic gates, I know we have simulators out there and so on nowadays, but this is a really easy thing that runs in HTML5, teaches basic binary, and then introduces the idea of Boolean algebra. And we go in and like in this case, so we're gonna show a binary number that has a decimal in it. So what happens, we know the one after the decimal point. Well, if we turn the switch on, you can see that it adds um, one over uh, two, which is 0.5, right? And if we add the, um, 0.01, it's 0.25, right? And you get the idea. And if you put more than one of these, it, it adds them together. So you see what the actual number would be, right? And then if you're teaching the binary number system and you want to show basic counting, it will show how you count. And the students can take control of this themselves and they can play with this to master the, the idea and the skill. It introduces each of the different gates. And then it goes through, and this is my favorite, is that we actually have... Um, uh, controllable gates that, that go along with the truth table. So here's a knock gate. If you put a zero in, you get a one out, right? The light's on. But if we turn the switch on, the light goes off and you can see in the truth table, we get a zero out. And we go to the next one, here's an AND gate. So two zeros in, shows the truth table, getting a zero out and the light's off, right? If we turn one on, it's still off, right? Turn the other one on, it's still off. But if we turn them both on, now the light turns on and we see um, the logic within the truth tables themselves. And we did this with each one of them. Yeah, I, I used this this week to teach uh, exclusive OR to my students. So, um, you know, again, these are uh, free tools um, and, and they cover, you know, it's not just um, cybersecurity. There's things in, like we said, mathematics, electronics, other, other areas I know you are bringing them multidisciplinary skills together that these might be um, useful tools. Okay, so that's um, the, um, the second part of what I really wanted to show you. And, and again, uh, Mike put the link in the, um, the chat. So if you're interested in, in using these things, um, and you can use them online as it is, or if you contact us, we can 
talk to you about how you download them, okay? But the beauty of these, they run on anything. They'll run on a, a smartphone. They'll run on, um, you know, a, 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 a Chrome, um, a Google Chrome pad, so on. So, mm -hmm. all right. Um, the other thing that we were working on, and Bob talked about this in the previous session, is that we've recently done a couple, um, and we're we're running an IoT collaboration network at, at Marine. Oh, uh, by the way, I down here there's some on using meters, there's some on Ohm's law, um, uh, latches, uh, Ohm's law simulation, so on. So I think you could you know see that these could be very useful, and also quite a few on networking. Um, if you're teaching subnetting, that's always a difficult task. Um, there's a really good one here on, on teaching subnetting as well. So here this shows the idea of subnetting. And then it shows that it's controlled by using this mask and borrowing bits to expand your mask and what that looks like. So you can see here we're borrowing the bits and what it looks like in the mask itself and then how many subnets that creates. And then we add to that by how many users are in each subnet now. So again, we drag this across, it changes our subnet. And it's all interactive. It's a really great way to lecture with this, but then it's also something you give to your students later that they can master the skill, you know? And then there's practice throughout. So in this case, we're borrowing three bits and so on. Uh, and it tells them immediately if they got things wrong and they can fix them, right, or do them over. Yeah, and I, I found once students go through this on their own and they're comfortable with the answers, they really mastered uh, subnetting. And that's very visual when we get to the, you know, the networks themselves. So here we show what a network address is, what a broadcast address, and then the usable networks, right? And now we go in and subnet this in half. So now we have two network addresses, right? Now we have two broadcast addresses and two sets of user addresses. And then here's a summary of each one. And we go through and just keep subnetting this. It gets smaller and smaller. You get four now, four usable sets of addresses. And then there's a summary of each of these. And then we start to introduce this idea of the magic number and the multiplier but we go all the way through and subnet as far as we can. And we did this with Bs and As as well. And then there's also one on BLSM. So if you're teaching variable length subnetting mass, there's a similar one on that. And then the beauty of this is at the end, then we test them. So now we have this network subnetted in two parts and they have to now give us what the network addresses would be and the broadcast addresses. And the next one, we're going to ask the usable addresses and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a little you know, different way to teach this more interactive, and I think it's actually been very effective. All right, um, now I'll go to the other one, and I was just waiting for it to load there, so sorry about that. Um, but we, um, we worked with Bob, and uh, the last section they talked about, you know, we did a couple exercises in Tinkercad, so if you haven't used Tinkercad, um, it's really a great tool. And um, what we're doing is teaching how to use Andrino boards and basic electricity electronics, breadboarding, and so on. So this is just a project here where they're creating a intersection of two uh, north and south, um, east, west uh, intersection. Here's the green lights, yellow and red. Uh, we're using an Andrino board to basically program these. And the beauty is here is they can learn how to code these as well. So you can use the Blockly method or you can actually go in and see the actual code itself or both. Okay. And then we can actually run it. So if we basically say simulate, here it'll start to run. And you'll see the green lights on one direction, the red lights on the other. We get a yellow light, then they switch and so on. Um, but we can teach really basic you know, processes and, and so on. And we've created an entire little factory with these in one of the little books that, that we did um, where it incorporates just Andrino boards, basic electricity and electronics and a whole bunch of different processes that would occur in a brewing factory. Okay, so this is another tool. I'm sure a lot of these are already using this, but, uh, but we've tried to create some you know, actual labs that, um, that can be used in the classroom with these. All right. And then the last thing, um, Mike has come up with, some, uh, with a really great idea of this idea of, of testing someone with an escape room. So in our case, we teach basic cybersecurity. And what he's gonna do now is take some of those um, concepts and the students have to prove their understanding of it to get out of the room, right? And this is a simple 2D, again, it's HTML5. Uh, it's very easy to port onto any platform. Um, and uh, students that I've had use these absolutely love these. They're really engaging. It's just a different way of learning. And um, I, I think it, um, it, 
it really brings students to a whole nother level of, of engagement and, and really teaching themselves in many cases. We showed this to a high school student. Uh, we, we run a little high school web show um, on, on Tuesday nights. And um, we demonstrated this to the high school student, didn't teach them how to use it at all. And they went and figured it out. And then the next show, they basically you know, described how to, um, to use the entire environment, how they solved each of the things and so on. Um, but that's, um, that's sort of what the power of these things are. So I'll, I'll pass it over to Mike at this point. So, so this is, um, we created uh, two versions for a midterm and two for a final. So this is a, um, uh, a, uh, for an ethical hacking course. And the way it's set up here, so hopefully the sound works, um, you get a little scenario, you enter the room, and immediately the chandelier falls and the lights go out. And then you have to look around in the dark and click for the lamp to turn on the lamp. And then you see that you have your little resources tab here. So any resources you find show up there. And then you have a series of a uh, checklist here. And so you have to find these answers in order to be able to get out of the escape room. And so they're, they're, they're basically moving around. So for example, here, they whenever they find something they, they can click on, they click on it. So the piece of paper with a lighter, they turn on the lighter and it basically shows them, oh, there's a password and that looks like it could be a username. So then that gets added to your resources over here so you can go back and reference it. And so they're just sort of moving around looking for any items that are clickable. And so in here, that looks like this laptop, you can log in. So you could try that username and password there to see if that gets you anything. Um, let's see here, you have um, some of these drawers are, can be open. So in here, there might be some books that you can click on. So this one, it looks like it's a tablet and has a login for the tablet. Um, let's see if any of these, we have the answers too. So if you want the answers, we can share the uh, solutions with you. We're working on an instructor guide for these to sort of help the instructors walk them through it. But I've talked to instructors, high school teachers, for example, who use this to reinforce things they've already taught, but then actually use it live with students to go through. Now, this is one of my favorite because uh, this is an old school iPod. So, so if you're old enough, you remember these old school iPods. So if you click on this, you click the play button, it's gonna play Morse code. And so for later in the, uh, challenge so maybe for that ipad for example you might need to know what that is so now students have to go out or if they're uh, faculty if they're old ham radio faculty they might uh, have to brush up on their uh, morris code and figure out what that morris code message is uh, um, and, and again just work their way around find anything that they can and that they can click on so over here they click on a remote control and it puts on a wireshark capture uh, on a screen over there and and again they work their way around they, they click they have to explore but they're trying to find anything that they can that will give them information that will help them uh fill out the list of uh that report checklist so there's i think there's other drawers as well here nope that's the same one and this was really the inspiration for the 3d so this is another drawer here and so it looks like let's see what's clickable here something should be clickable Maybe not. Um, but uh, but as I said, the, the the final exams are different rooms and have different objects in them, but they have the same learning outcomes. The same thing for the midterm, different different uh, objects in there, but the same learning outcomes. But it really forces a student to sort of engage with themselves rather uh, in, you know, engage in this environment rather than just taking a standard. Uh, you know, um, uh, um, midterm exam that they normally would do. So that's just one example of, of what we've built. So um, I think we've come to the end. Any questions? Let me look inside questions. And, and those escape rooms were sort of the inspiration for what we did with the virtual reality environment. Thank you to you both. Um, thanks for such an interesting, uh, not just an interesting presentation, but so many resources, so much that folks will be able to use. And I have a couple of questions that came in um, via private chat. One was, uh, in terms of the supply chain faculty, the teachers, what are the most important trends in cybersecurity that, they that you feel they need to prepare their students for? 
I mean, I'll, I'll take on and Mike, if you want to answer anything added to this, but um, I, I would say that um, cybersecurity has really come to a point that it's everyone's responsibility. So I don't, it doesn't matter if you're an electrical tech, you know, elect, electronics technician, uh, industrial controls person, um, if you're the person ordering equipment or installing equipment, things like that, um, it's everyone's responsibility now and everyone has a part in keeping an environment safe or in some cases, um, allowing for uh, um, someone to take advantage of that space or penetrate that space with unauthorized access, unknowingly in many cases. But that's why it's absolutely critical. I think that you know, every person in the organization needs to um, you know, be aware of, of what, what's happening. And then the other thing is just how IoT and the proliferation of smart devices, cloud-based intelligence, all these things are changing the way we do things every day. And you, you may not think that you know, your information's out there, or your organization's information's out there, but you'd be surprised on just how much information is, is publicly available to an, uh, uh, to an individual that wants to do harm or, or you know, uh, a nation state or whoever the threat actor might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, in, in that environment, you are running um, devices and appliances that, that may not be easily updatable, all right? So, so if there's an upgrade or an update available to a firmware to an, or to an operating system to some of your equipment and instrumentation, you want to get that update because most times those updates have security fixes and, and patches, so you want to make sure you, you're running the latest and greatest. Uh, but and so just don't assume that your devices are secure out of the box. You want to you, you know to, uh, be very proactive about making sure that they're secure. And then also you know um, a, a lot of organizations now they 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 um, they take uh, some of their devices and they air gap them, meaning that they separate them from the production network and assume that then because they're air gapped. Um, they're protected, and then I don't have to worry about the security of those devices because nobody can get to them. Well, attackers have figured out how to jump that air gap and get to those devices. So you even have to consider the security of those devices that you think might be isolated. So there's just a whole lot of things that uh, are going to be pertinent now and going forward for, for uh, these educators. So one last time before we close off, I want to just go back to how the, the faculty, how, how our attendees can enroll in those workshops. Why don't you give us one more plug for those? Because I think that's a really exciting opportunity. Yeah, I'll put it in chat. Um, but this is the actual link. Um, so we're in the process of scheduling um, some new courses uh, in June. And, um, you know, we'd be willing to talk to the community and, you know, the National Center and so on, if you'd like a specific course for your, uh, for your group. Um, I mean, we have funding for this, so it's not a matter of funding, it's just a matter of, of logistics. Um, but um, I, I think that course would probably be, be very beneficial to people in this community. Mm -hmm. and, and here's just the Insight Center as well. So just so you can, if you want to join and become a member, so that's the new National Center for Cybersecurity now from NSF and so they have the links to any new training that they're going to have any upcoming training so you want to you, you want to sort of follow this this website and make sure you stay aware of, of what they're doing and what they're providing if if your school is looking at becoming a, a center of academic excellence uh, you know an NSA designated center of academic excellence the insight center would be your first point of contact as well cuz they provide mentoring for that process <laughs>